Hello, everyone. I just want to thank you all for joining on time. My name is Bob Hansman. I'm the Director of Security Technologies with Forcepoint, uh, working with our security labs and uh, other departments on both the security research side of things as well as technologies that we need to both provide as well as ones we need to work with. Um, compatibility and support as people move to the cloud and so forth um, is just as important as being able to block the latest threat. Um, we can't protect you if we don't work with what you got. So that's kind of the realm of my focus. And today I wanted to share the latest findings from our threat research in the security labs here at Forcepoint. A um, couple of housekeeping pieces that I want to communicate. First of all, in your interface, you've noticed that there is a QA panel to the left there where you can submit questions. Uh, we will be taking some of the questions uh, here as uh, time allows and um, as they may be relevant to the larger audience, but we'll also be covering a lot of those offline uh, and responding to you afterwards. Um, then uh, there is also a link there for resources. And in that, you can actually download the report right now. Uh, it's available um, on our website. We'll be doing an email thank you that will have links to that and other resources that you'll receive later. But you can actually begin downloading that report uh, right now if your bandwidth can handle both the webinar and the download. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier to the uh, first group that joined uh, while we waited for the rest, uh, there is a survey that uh, we have available here also that is just asking for a handful of questions to help us understand uh, perhaps your uh, personal and uh, corporate and agency issues in relationship to a couple of key points um, that will help us also, and we'll uh, share some of that information uh, with you also uh, later on, not here in the session, but in, uh, in our communications with you as we correlate that with uh, others that we're also surveying. The survey is actually going out quite broad, but we felt that, hey, if you're interested enough to uh, give us your time, you probably would be interested in seeing other people's opinions on this information. So we wanted to make that accessible to you as well. So uh, without fear and without further ado, we're going to go ahead and push through on the agenda. So the agenda today is uh, Forcepoint. Who is Forcepoint? We'll cover that very briefly. Uh, most of you are here because you know, but uh, it's actually uh, still relatively new in the industry, um, celebrating about our third month. And uh, then we'll go into the, the depth of the report itself. Insider threat, we've taken a breakdown on that aspect of security. Uh, not just from the standpoint of, ooh, somebody in my company is malicious and wants to steal stuff, but there's so many other aspects. And we'll talk about the insider threat uh, issues that we face, including those parts of it that deal with an external attacker, where they become an insider once they've made the breach. We'll then share some of our uh, advanced threat research insights. We're going to be drilling into how the advanced threats have evolved again in the last year and become more complicated, and some of the evasion techniques that they're using and how they've changed in a way that makes it harder to detect. Um, but also, what are some of the things they're doing that give us the clues we need to detect them? And we have a couple of uh, specific sample case studies that we'll be sharing as well. Then we'll talk about the specific aspect of this evolution, which is more than just the combined threats or complex threats. There was a couple of words that have been used over the last probably decade for vendors who had both web and email products. But the attack nature has actually evolved to a point where we need to understand how those solutions should work together, not just the high-level marketing solution message that says, hey, they work better together. But how do they work? And we'll talk about how some of the threats have evolved to the point where using those tools, if they can share information, can actually be more effective. Then we'll talk about the move to cloud. As many of you begin to embrace cloud, and a lot of the studies and research shows it's just going to, to continue to move faster, we need to understand how your security posture needs to adjust to that. So we'll talk about how the threats are already evolving in order to take advantage of those moving to the cloud. And now that some of the security is out of your hand, what are the, some of the things they're looking at? And finally, there's a section in the report called Thoughts from the Office of the CISO. And this is a review with thoughts and insights from our own Office of the Chief Security Officer 
where they have had to recently go through, as part of the Forcepoint evolution, the integration of three different security companies from three different parts of the world, integrating three different network types. And they had to do all that while the press, of course, had announced this wonderful new joint venture and painted a great big red target on us. So we're going to share with you some of the things we had to deal with in our situation. So any of you who have your own network evolutions or perhaps mergers and acquisitions, uh, expanding to absorb a new operation, uh, that section may be of poignant importance to you. And so we'll uh, move on to that. And then as time allows, we'll have Q&A. But as I said, any remaining questions or questions you may want to submit that are just for you, we'll try and contact you directly afterwards, uh, hoping that you did give us a valid email address. We'll respond to that offline. So let's move forward and take a look at our first topic here, which is essentially who is Force Point. These are some of the key salient points. It was first unveiled about three months ago on January 14th. It is a joint venture owned by both Raytheon and the Vista Equity Partners. So there's two major partners there. But what they did was they brought together three different companies, as I just alluded to, WebSense, Raytheon Cyber Products, and the StoneSoft NextGen Firewall business. So those three entities have come together, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, uh, their own IT, and we've had to merge all of that together. And the product offerings actually do have some blends that uh, – is what gave us the insight for this report. From a pure research standpoint, each of these organizations was looking at the threat landscape in a different perspective. And this report is the result of those researchers who actually started working together almost a year ago from the WebSense and Raytheon side, and then correlated with some deep evasion research that was provided through the StoneSoft uh, security teams and really helped to give us a much broader perspective on these topics. And that's why this year's report is not like many of the others you might see where they're going to talk about this kind of threat. Now let's talk about that kind of threat, and let's talk about this kind of threat. It's a higher level issue because if you are focused on all of those little things, uh, you might miss the big picture. It's like purchasing a car and you select it based on what kind of tires it has, what kind of seats it has, and maybe one or two bells and whistles that you just always find important. But you haven't looked at the broader issue of how does it all work together? Is it reliable? Does it give you the performance you need? Is it something that everybody can, who needs to drive it can drive it safely and effectively? Does it meet the bottom line need? So this year's report is going to focus on those broader topics, supporting it with all the technical detail that relates to it. For example, on the insider threat, uh, a lot of people are still kind of getting their hands around this, and the insider threat, the definition has been hmm, somewhat muddied in the press as they write articles and coverage from a specific angle, which they're doing the right thing, but unfortunately they give the impression that this story is about insider threat when it's actually only one aspect. Insider threat is basically about any kind of an attack that originates or receives cooperation from something within the organization. Now, this could be both willing and unwilling. Uh, everything from the accidental person who was socially engineered to do the wrong thing to perhaps their machine was simply infected and it's now been remotely controlled by somebody outside because the outside attacker, now that they have a foot into the organization and on the network, they're now an insider. But they're, of course, your worst nightmare because they're an insider who is determined, knowledgeable, and has a lot of tools at their, um, at their, uh, you know, at hand to allow them to move throughout the organization, move laterally, access systems that perhaps the real user wouldn't know how to access, and so forth. So. While we call it the insider threat, we need to be thinking about both the true insider, the employee who's been hired who intentionally or unintentionally can be a problem, but also how that affects them uh, or affects that system when it's been compromised externally. Now, Forrester completed a survey and indicated that most of the actual data breaches from an insider threat were internal incidents and that 
So that's the number one leading of a breach, but also that the majority of those were accidental. Um, and this is a little bit of a shame because you would think that by now, with all the news about accidental mistakes, it has um, progressed and, and people would be doing better. Uh, in fact, I've been in the industry so long, I remember when the average user on the network they didn't have a whole lot of technical expertise. As a matter of fact, if you remember VCRs, uh, a good portion of the users on the network didn't know how to program the time or the clock on their VCR. Technology was beyond them. But today, most of our employees, they grew up with Nintendo and game systems. They, they have smartphones and they know all the features in it. They take pride in their technology. So to see these accidental losses continue is really a shame. And uh, there's a number of things we need to do to involve them in our security, to educate them. They want the education now. It shouldn't be as much of an uphill struggle as it used to be. And we can take advantage of, uh, of that desire to turn them into maybe not the greatest advocate, but they no longer have to be a liability. Now, the trouble with insider abuse, though, is that it's difficult to detect. It's difficult for a variety of reasons that we mentioned in the report. There's a number of things that they can do that it just looks like normal activity because the things being affected are part of their normal job. So you wouldn't think of it as being malicious activity. Um, but the real problem is, is that even if they are doing something they shouldn't be doing, very few organizations have the systems in place to identify that. DLP tends to be a tip of the iceberg kind of a thing where, okay, we'll make sure that they can't access the data they shouldn't. They can't upload it. They can't copy it to a USB. But this is just table stakes in today's insider threat kind of war. And what we need to be doing is much more complex. The worst part here, though, is the way we're spending our money. We also, uh, while we're in the season of the annual threat reports, we're also in the season of all of the IT budget spending analyst reports. I think I've received probably four or five in just the last few weeks. And they're all telling us how everybody's going to spend their money. And I love those reports because the numbers in there, I always wish they were my numbers when I was dealing with IT. Um, you always wonder who they're talking to because these aren't exactly mine. But it does give you the trend. And that's all we can really extract from that. And the trend is we're spending 80 to 85, one report even showed 86% of our money to keep the external threats under control, which means we're spending less than 15% identifying an internal threat, which again could have been an external threat that has been successful. A system has been breached. And that breached system, that compromised user identity, is being used to somehow uh, damage or steal information from the organization. I say damage because we'll be talking about ransomware shortly, and that's just one aspect of it. But in the end, we don't see it because we simply aren't spending in that area. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not just an IT issue. We need to educate the users. That's how we're going to minimize the accidents. Um, we need to involve the users, um, and they will step up to the plate. Now, there are a couple of things we can do beyond, again, just a tool and a system. Products don't solve problems. It's been an axiom of mine for many years. And so what do you do beyond the products? Well, you have to have policies. Now, some of those policies might be enforced by a product. But the fact of the matter is, a policy is also the guide to the user on how to get something done. It should not be seen as, uh, hey, these are the hoops we want you to jump through. It needs to be, here's how I can get my job done, get it done safely, and move on to the next thing. It needs to be presented in a positive way. Those policies combined with processes can help them accomplish their tasks and make them be successful. And if we do it right, that alone will eliminate many of the accidents because the accidents occur because there is no process, there is no policy, or they are so loose and flexible that mistakes can happen, such as when multiple people feel that it might be their job to announce something. And so they all do, and several of them include information that really probably shouldn't have been included, but the only one who could have made the call was the right person. Uh, we see e-blasts go out. Um, a city government once sent out an e-blast, 
and the accident was that the way they wrote the merger between the database and the email system is the information which was tax and personally identifiable information. The city was sending tax data to um, the citizens of the city, all of the residents. And unfortunately, they merged it with the address of the next person on the list. So everybody in the city received somebody else's personal identifiable information. And it's because they didn't have a process that involved testing. And so little things like that are what caused the accidents. It's not always just a reply all. It's not um, a social engineering. There's a lot of these things that when we started looking at the larger breaches, it was the lack of process and policy. And those, of course, are then enforced through technology controls and risk management. Uh, you need to have those risk management processes in place uh, supported with auditing, monitoring to maintain them because no business stays the same month to month, year to year. We're constantly evolving. It's the only way to evolve. Um, even a lot of government agencies that the citizens of those governments may look at them and feel like they're monolithic and slow and not moving, but they actually do implement a great deal of change. So regardless of who you are, what vertical you're in, uh, we do need to have constant cyclical auditing, monitoring, and risk management assessments in order to uh, keep these policies, processes, and technology controls up to date and effective. Now, Gartner predicts that 25% of self-discovered enterprise breaches will be found using user behavioral analytics. That's a big quote there on the side, and uh, we mentioned that on there. This is actually one of the newer areas, user behavioral analytics, uh, user experience, or UEBA uh, technologies. They're still arguing over the acronyms, um, but we today can start taking advantage of that kind of technology. This is the technology that goes one step beyond what a uh, what a DLP would do. Instead of just looking for when the data is being stolen, it's the kind of thing that would realize that somebody is putting in an awful lot of overtime, and yet when I correlate that with HR time cards or the just their ID badge, when they log in and log out of the building, it doesn't sync up. That could be an indication that the machine's been compromised and somebody is remotely controlling it after hours. Or it could be that from that machine they're accessing multiple accounts. And while, okay, I can see somebody from IT coming to my laptop and in order to fix something, logging in with their credentials, having a single laptop that's been logged in using the credentials of 20 to 25 people, that should set off some alarms. And there's a lot of other things like that. And in fact, those examples are the kind of things that would have detected Edward Snowden before he stole information from the NSA. So we have a lot of indicators that could come out days, weeks, even months in advance of the actual data theft before DLP even has a chance to kick in using these kinds of technologies. So if you want to get ahead of the curve, this is definitely uh, a useful uh, tool, and it also has the value of securing the system at another stage of the chain after a machine's been compromised or breached. Now let's shift the conversation into the advanced threats, which is the section traditionally you would get from security companies. They all like to talk about advanced threats because it's always exciting, except that we've been talking about it for years. You know, well, they came up with some cool little new acronyms and stuff, and APTs, um, different parts of the world latched onto it, others didn't. Somebody found some new marketing terms and phrases. But advanced threats, this is still a problem. But it's become more complicated to the point that maybe we need to start thinking of them more as aggregated threats. Because an advanced threat in the past was maybe a zero-day piece of malware that they then put into and delivered through an email that was just using a standard social engineering technique. They would outsource it to somebody else. They worked really hard on one part of the attack and then let somebody else, they would outsource the who's going to control the botnet to collect my information for me, who's going to handle the exploit kit so that I can find a, a vulnerability because what I've written is a really cool piece of malware that I want delivered. And so the attackers really were focusing on just one piece or another. What they've begun to do is coordinate much more closely. The attacks now are not just out of a six, seven stage attack. It's not just one or two new p 
pieces of, of an attack, but they are looking at every stage and how they can make it more evasive. So if the stages of the attack are working together, how do you solve that problem? Well, that's because you, your solutions have to start working together. And as we just talked about on the insider threat, they have to go beyond just stopping malware. If all of your investment is on stopping malware, you're missing a half dozen other opportunities to identify an attack and stop it. It would be like a bank saying, oh, we don't need cameras, we don't need alarms, we don't need motion sensors, forget the locks on the front door, we have a good, strong safe. And as long as the safe door is, is the best quality, we don't have to worry about anything. But they know that they need to be able to stop any kind of an attack, physical, of course, at multiple stages. And we need to consider the same thing. This reference to dwell time is something that I'll talk about a little bit more as we go forward, but this is the concept, that dwell time concept, we're actually seeing customers measure the success of IT security in dwell time. On one hand, they need to reduce the number of breaches. Granted, we can keep working on that, but now everybody realizes it's not a matter of if I'm going to be breached. It's not even a matter of when I'm going to be a breach. Right now, a lot of them don't know if right now, am I breached? Is there somebody currently on my network that shouldn't be there? How do I know if I currently have an infection? And when we drill into one of the two uh, uh, attacks that we specifically are using in our case studies here, you'll see where some of these breaches go on for almost a year before anybody identified it. In this case, we were the ones that identified it and had to notify them, hey, by the way, did you know you've been breached? So these new advanced attacks are focused uh, are, are the focus of a special investigations team. That's the other thing is while we brought the expertise together from all of these different organizations, we have formed a special investigation team who is taking and, and the front they're the the front line analysts who are going to dig into these things when we first find them, particularly the new earth shaking. Somebody's doing something completely different. They're using a different technique. They're using a new evasive, uh, evasive measure. Uh, they now have responded to the new patch that came out for how the Internet works. Remember things like Heartbleed and stuff like that that are part of the Internet infrastructure? This is the team that would look at breaches that are at that level. So again, it's not just malware. It's every aspect of the attack chain. Now, the first of the two case studies that we want to drill into is the first one here is Jakku. Now, this is a massive network uh, attack. It is not just a botnet. It is not just um, malware. It has all these components. It's, it's an aggregated threat where everything was designed to work together. So they know how to complement one another. Um, different portions of it, for example, will use multiple domains for their communications in case you're blocking some of the ones because somebody's become aware of it, and I'll talk about that in a moment. We are looking at um, a global attack while there's significant clustering in Japan, South Korea, and China. Uh, we've also noticed uh, victims around the world. Right now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite, um, quite extensive. Um, also, we've tracked where the actual... Um, servers, the, the command and control servers are. Uh, we've tracked those back down to um, being primarily in Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and Singapore, but again, those are the primary locations. These bad guys will move from one site to another. That's nothing new. Again, if many of you remember, there was a phishing problem years and years ago. I think it's still around, but the phishing problem, most phishing was actually found coming out of China. Now, it wasn't because China was the source of it. It was because that's where people could get a lot of free servers. They were cheap, they were inexpensive, and there were very few controls. But there was an earthquake, and it shut most of China off from the Internet, and the spam wasn't going out. In less than 48 hours, the vast majority of all spam was back online coming out of Poland and several other countries. They had backup plans. I wish my network was that resilient. It's amazing the way they can move from one place to another. So um, we've announced this uh, information, uh, but of course these are just the primary places where we're seeing the activity. Now the payload, okay, the actual malware, 
Um, this is actually a two-stage kind of an attack. It comes in, in in two small components. By breaking it up, it means there's less clues for something like a sandbox to identify. If if each one only does something that's sort of malicious, is the sandbox going to trigger or not? Maybe only when the two are together do they create the problem. There's a lot of, of reasons why we'll see dual-stage or other multi-stage downloaders. And in this case, they took advantage of a lot of people using BitTorrents or otherwise downloading unlicensed software, um, you know, like going to a Juarez site where you can get free software that is not really you know, from the manufacturer or somebody's figured a way out to make it not ask for a license key. Basically, you can almost say these people kind of deserved it. Unfortunately, while this may have been majority, majority a consumer problem, we also found a lot of corporations affected because employees have their own laptops. They tend to do some of the things on it that they shouldn't, and this exposed their corporations and their agencies to exposure, to a, to a breach and to the outside influence of these attackers. Now, it was able to get by a lot of the uh, defenses in place. Some of these organizations, very solid security, but it would use cryptography, uh, stenography, uh, fake file types, stealth injection. It would even look for certain antivirus engines and change aspects of the attack based on the antivirus it found in place. It did all of these things probing up front and then adjusting the attack to make sure that the next stage of the attack would be successful because they already had learned something about the network and they moved on. So it was just really very advanced, very adaptable um, and used a lot of techniques all in one attack. And this is, again, where we come up with that phrase of aggregated threats. It's not just one or two pieces of zero-day throwing in a bunch of old stuff. Um, this was highly, highly coordinated and thought, thought out. Now, one of the questions that uh, we've had uh, when we did this earlier today uh, in Europe was we had people asking about, well, hold it, what about notifications and, and how do we learn about this? And this investigation has been going on for over six months. And as we were uncovering these details, we began working with the CERT organization. So each nation's CERT organization would be involved. And with them, we would coordinate. And sometimes they would handle it. Sometimes we would get involved to work with customers or the victims involved to let them know. And so uh, they were actually driving it. And we let them do it because um, to the point of gee, should somebody write a, uh, a defense someday that when you get attacked, it automatically attacks back? Well, you really can never be sure just from digital information of exactly who's involved. I mean, we can identify an IP address and through other means maybe identify where we think the facility is or that server or device is, uh, but still somebody needs to do some physical on-site inspection, and this is where working with law enforcement is vital if you really want to uh, change the world in regards to advanced threats. So we've been working with them. On these evasion techniques, though, I do want to point out also there's a, a kill chain. Um, a lot of people have been talking about a seven-stage kill chain for a couple of years here. And typically, stages four through seven are where these techniques would be used. And of course, you know, stages two, like using multiple redirects and otherwise hiding uh, the method of, of uh, communication, uh, making an email look like it's something that it's not. You know, this is where the lure crafting comes in. Um, those are those stages two and three are where most evasion has taken about historically. Maybe some vulnerability um, uh, through the use of these exploit kits, some vulnerability exploits. But um, that's been rather limited. This attack started pulling together techniques for basically all seven stages. The entire kill chain, every stage, had an evasion technique built into it. So again, this is a level of complexity that you used to only see in something that was suspected to be a nation-state style attack. The second of the two examples that we want to talk about um, is Locky. Now, Locky is currently, uh, you can find information on it on our website in the blogs. A full report on Jaku is going to be released uh, in just a week or so, early May. And so you can expect a full white paper drill down of the Jaku um, 
report. And But Lockheed was something we were working on kind of in parallel. It came up separately. It was a, a type of, of ransomware that our special investigations team was able to do some reverse engineering. It used uh, a technique, not terribly new, domain generation algorithms, so DGA, to change where it would phone home to every day another type of evasive uh, technique. So what we did was we reversed engineered this and we ran an experiment. And so this was kind of the interesting thing. We wanted to know how resilient they were. So we reverse engineered the algorithm and then we published all of the addresses that would be used by this uh, particular Lockheed attack for the next period of time. Within f five days, um, they would they they change the algorithm. So originally they would generate six different addresses a day, and after we had released our list, five days later they adjusted it to produce 14 a day, and change the algorithm. So we had to reverse engineer it again. So we reverse engineered it again, released the next. You know, here's what you're going to see for 30 days, all the different addresses, and they updated it again to release 23 domains a day. Um, so it was interesting to see how responsive they were and how much they watched because it didn't take them too long to make these uh, responses, a matter of less than a week, and, uh, and they would make the changes necessary. So like Jakku, where every aspect of the attack was well thought through and crafted, Lockheed shows that they're also willing to invest in constantly maintaining different aspects of the attack. Um, at Right now, we're, we see about 19,000 victims of the of the Lockheed virus, and uh, it's been more than double that, of course, at its high point. Um, but we are continuing to monitor the impact, and uh, and we're learning the habits. This is part of how you profile the attackers. Is you'll start noticing the way they they do the maintenance is almost more indicative of of who the attackers are than the components that they actually release. I wanted to point out, though, the size of this problem. Uh, ransomware in general, there's a couple of differences. Number one, it's not stealing your data. It's just going to corrupt it, and I think that's obvious because of the, the definition. And it's estimated that $325 million U.S. have been paid in ransoms in the last year. There's a number of easy ways around this. We list those in the, in the report. That's something else you'll find in the actual printed report. As we talk about problems, we also give you recommendations on both processes and, and policies and things that you can do that will lock it down and help provide more protection for you. Uh, for example, many of these organizations, the reason that they had to pay the ransom is because they didn't have backups. They just flat out didn't. Um, and, and that's your first first response. If you find out you've got uh, an infection, and if you're dealing with that dwell time problem we talked about earlier, then you should be able to identify that there's something going on on your network rather quickly. They shouldn't have weeks to encrypt your system, which, by the way, it should take a long time. If you've got, uh, you know, 100 gigabytes of data, how long does it take to compress that without setting off a few alarms? It's, it's something they, they will do because they're trying not to be too noticed at that stage. So they're going to take their time, do it quietly, not try to set off any performance uh, alarms or other, other alerts that you may have on the system. So if you're watching for anomalous behavior, you should be able to identify these systems and then quickly realize that, okay, well, we'll lose a day's, uh, day of work, but we can restore from tape. Let's shut down the affected systems, recover from tape, and go on. And so because a lot of organizations didn't have that concept of how to identify and reduce dwell time and weren't prepared for what if we do get breached beyond, oh, we'll have to notify customers, we'll have to buy fraud protection, uh, protection for all of our consumer uh, customers or whatever, they really haven't thought of the very specific attacks and how to recover. These are some of the things that we're going into in the report and give you some more detailed recommendations. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the evasion techniques. This is actually an area that while 
Uh, of course, the full kill chain was something that WebSense uh, was working on. RCP dealt with it more on the last half of the kill chain, where WebSense focused on the front. Overall, evasion techniques was an expertise in Stonesoft. So again, having these three labs together and sharing their expertise, um, these guys were having fun, which is a scary thing to see, a bunch of researchers having fun talking about how ugly the world is. And so they're digging into these things and looking at all the different ways that the evasion techniques affect different stages of the life cycle. So like I mentioned before, stages four through seven of the life cycle is where we saw a lot of evolution in the last year. Um, these things were not new or unique. It's just that the emphasis in the cyber criminal underground, the emphasis they've put on evasion has just stepped up a major notch. So some of the things we've seen are IP fragmentation um, and uh, TCP segmentation, doing things out of order. And some of these things take advantage of, like IP fragmentation, takes advantage of the way the Internet works. If the information doesn't come in nice sequential packets, a lot of security solutions won't work. And so they've found that they can deliver their components in a way using legitimate methods that get around your security. Matter of fact, I'm going to give, uh, for the techies in the audience, um, we're going to pop up, here you go, a couple of RFCs. Uh, these are standards, um, and these are from 1981. So these are, what, 35 years ago? 35 years ago, these were standards created for how information could be sent at a low level and how those packets should be formed, and they actually explain how to do some of these evasive techniques. It's in the standard. It's just that somebody went back and read a document that was 81 years old, produced, or excuse me, 35 years old, and, and, and took the time to understand its implications and created uh, a technique that was actually described in the standard. So if you want to look up these RFCs, they're, they're very interesting and kind of explain some of these things. But this is another example of like Heartbleed, where it was designed at a time when the kind of breach we saw around it, nobody was doing that. So they didn't worry about it. So again, the old standards are coming back to bite us. And so uh, again, we need to look at how our systems work and make sure that do we have um, not just a firewall, but a next-gen firewall that can actually deal with those kinds of techniques and make sure that, no, I do not accept traffic unless it comes in properly shaped. This is, again, think of the buffer overflow problems that we had about a decade ago when that got really hot. And it was a common way to launch code inside a computer um, even though they didn't want to launch legitimately the application because your antivirus would have caught it that way. But they just used a common memory overflow technique that was well documented they just learned how to use it in, to support their malicious intent. So these kinds of things are continuing to, to uh, happen, and we're continuing to monitor them. And uh, the details, like I said, are shared inside the full report. Now, I alluded a little bit earlier that uh, web and email together, this is something that uh, a lot of marketing teams have talked about for quite some time, um, mainly as a way to you know, sell both products. But there's been some changes here. Now, just from the email side alone, we've seen some rather dramatic um, uh, evolutions. Essentially, we saw um, a significant drop in spam. So spam is down. But it's not because they gave up. They saw that there was more money to be made in malware, and so they've stopped sending spam, and now they're focusing on malicious because the amount of malicious traffic has really increased. Of just unwanted email, which would be spam as well as all the malicious things going on there, 91.7% include a link, and yet very few email security products will do more than just look at the URL in the email. And if it's not a known, if it's not on their checklist, it just drops it. So this is where maybe you need something that can do some URL wrapping. It, uh, it works together with the web piece. So as the web thing learns something, it shares it with the email piece, allows the email piece to be more proactive with emails. But also if something comes through an email, the web piece is prepared to do the more deep analysis. These solutions have to work together. 
Um, and part of that example, I realize I sometimes talk quickly, was about the intelligence sharing. So the products need to work together. There's reasons, forensics and things like that. A lot of people have been talking about it. Few actually execute where using the same interface, I can see a web incident and then immediately track it down and find out that that link, though, was tied to this email that that was also tied to this DLP incident. Being able to have these things in a single UI definitely has some forensic and investigation capabilities. But just from a pure proactive defense capability, what if when the organization, because they have a unified security research division, receives something like a new email, they look at the URL, they share it with the web team, and now this concept, this thing being shared in email, is also now going to be recognized on the website because when we see some of these things, like, for example, we've had a number of recent disasters, earthquakes, and so forth, and when those things happen, we see a lot of fake emails asking people to donate to help the victims. We also see fake websites pop up, typically from the same people reusing the same content. Well, whether it's seen on the web or the email side first, both need to be def defended against. And so having that true integrated web and email is going to uh, provide the security you need there. So the threat intelligence needs to be shared. The forensics capabilities and, and ability to dig into incidents needs to be integrated and make it easier to go back and forth uh, between them to truly uncover the breadth of what may already be a breach. And that's, again, part of our new reality. We're not just trying to figure out uh, what we stopped and why we stopped it and how well it worked. We're going to have to see, okay, we stopped it here, but let's make sure maybe – it got in yesterday before the defenses were updated. This kind of stuff happens. It's a reality that a lot of us don't like to think about. And definitely a lot of the vendors that we work with try to make it sound like, use my product and you'll never see another problem. But the fact of the matter is, nothing works at 100%. So the best way you can defend yourself is to make sure that they work together. Because if Stage one, just think of the kill chain. If stage one is only 90% effective, stage two is 90% of that 10%. So now you've got a 99% efficiency. Stage three, now you're 99.9%. If every stage is only 90% effective, you get five nines of efficiency because the entire kill chain is covered. Now a quick question here about um, what do the United States, UK, Germany, and France have in common? This is something that we uncovered as we were digging into some of the regular statistics we see, such as where in the world are you going to find the top hosting of phishing emails? Okay, where are we going to see malware hosted? Where are we going to see all of those different stats are always tracked? Well, the United States, UK, Germany, and France are in the top 10 of the countries where we find a lot of the malicious content being hosted. And so it's, uh, which is interesting, a lot of people look to say, oh, where's China, where's Russia? Well, you know, again, those were unregulated countries and, you know, say what you will about, oh, we think it all came from there. It was just easy to host everything there. But around the world, and I've done interviews with uh, the press in a variety of countries and they've asked us about this and, and the the a lot of those old countries are not on these lists anymore because it's no longer the easiest place to go. The fact of the matter is it's pretty hard for these bad guys to set anything up anywhere um, because everybody's pretty much picked up their game. Uh, countries that were just getting into the Internet three years ago now have booming industries in cloud services. And so the Internet has become a hard place for the bad guys to post their wares. And that's another reason why they've had to focus on evasion. So the evolution that has made our traditional web and email kind of security seem ho-hum and boring, that's why they've become so complicated. And, and as we're, again, coining the term, they've become aggregated threats, not just one or two elements, but a full end-to-end -end complex approach. So as I mentioned earlier, um, email, and, and if you think about it, Almost every breach that we've really looked into, if it wasn't an insider, if it's from an external source, it almost always starts with an email. And yet email is the most boring of things, 
And it's amazing how many of us have email solutions that we just keep renewing it because, well, that's not the, the area we should be focusing on. Let's get a sandbox. Let's get the next you know, silver bullet. And there are no silver bullets. Now, I mentioned that we were going to talk a little bit about moving to the cloud. So this is a business initiative that many of you have. You're moving to the cloud. And depending on, on the, uh, the survey, here you can see at the bottom, ID, IDG thinks 2016, more IT services um, will live in the cloud. Um, and by 2018, Gartner's got a report that um, you know, over 50% of corporations will primarily be running in the cloud. Everybody's got you know, huge stats. The bottom line is we're going to the cloud. Uh, matter of fact, the 2018, 2018 number from Gartner was about U.S. military organizations, U.S. government organizations that are highly regulated, and they don't want to use the cloud at all. But they can't really avoid it. They're going to have to start doing things that they can only get in the cloud. So they're, they're going through the due diligence that, unfortunately, many of us haven't. For example, does, does the cost savings outweigh the security benefits? It's interesting where... I got into the business, a lot of companies didn't have PCs. They were still using dumb terminals and renting time on mainframes. So they would have all of their accounting information hosted on somebody's mainframe elsewhere. But before they trusted their data to be in someone else's computer, they would have assurances. Many times there was a physical tour of the facility. They got to see the guards, see the cameras, see the good locks on the doors. They got to see the security that was going to protect their data but today we tend to accept cloud services as if they're all secure, right? Well, again, let's blow the smoke away. There's no such thing as a cloud service. Every cloud service has a server somewhere. There's hardware somewhere providing that. There's network interfaces, cards, and routers that it's flowing through. And so our information is secure is unsecured or secured depending on what they do because those services are outside of our control. So we need to start looking at the security offered by our services, not just do they have the bells and whistles that that department needs. Now that of course is a two-edged sword. IT needs to become the department of yes. For too long, nobody wants to come to IT because all IT is going to do is find all the holes in it. And what we need to do is let them know that, you know, hey, I'm glad you came to us. Let's see how we can help you get that done. Now, it's going to be a little tricky because I've got to balance that with security, but let's boil down the main things you're looking for. A good example of this would be the discussion a lot of organizations have had around file sharing. There are some file sharing services that, depending on the nature of how you share and who you share with, some are more secure than others. Some have an ease of use uh, challenge. And you have to balance all of that together and make a choice so that when your users come to you and say, hey, I want to share large files because I can't send via email, your answer is, no, 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 don't use that service you just told me about. The answer should be, oh, I'm so glad you contacted me because we actually have a service that we, char we paid for it, we've chosen them, we've validated their security. Um, it's not quite as easy to use as the one you chose, so up front, I understand that, but this is the best way to get your information, and we knew you'd need something like this, so we planned ahead. I don't know that you were thinking of them. Become the department of, yes, I will see how I can help you. Um, now, who's using those cloud services is going to be a big driver. Uh, you have to get them to make their choices and prioritizations. Um, but then, of course, we have to deal with the problem of shadow IT. The interesting problem with shadow IT is that everybody kind of knows it's there, but a survey recently showed that only 8%, only 8%, we're not, we're in single digits, only 8% of companies felt that they had a good feel for what apps people were using. And they were letting it go. Many of them are just letting it go. As long as they know what it is, they put out a little warning, but they're going to let it until they have the official one. So they're monitoring shadow IT, and when they see people using services that there's actually an official corporate one, they were reaching out to them. I interviewed one company that had this kind of a program. They would proactively reach out to the user and let them know, look, you're not in trouble. You've got your job to do, and I want to help you do it. They let off being very positive. And unfortunately, um, 
you know, that experience can scare some people. They're not used to that. They're used to IT being very, no, no, you can't do that. Here's the way you'll do it or you'll not do it at all. IT has to become a little more personable if we're going to embrace the users because remember that insider threat and the accidents that happened? Those accidents happen often because they don't know and they need to see IT as their partner. So to overcome many of these things we're discussing in this year's report, IT needs to evolve into a department of yes. Now, you can also see here in the lower right-hand corner here another stat. 60% of organizations indicate that they are seriously concerned about security. Um, security concerns continue to grow. Um, they, they don't know what their cloud services are capable of, and as I mentioned earlier, they're not sure what security is inherent to that security service. Do they have their servers physically locked? Do they have their servers maintained and patched so that they can't be hacked? Or are they something that this exploit I just read about, you know, or even the exploit I read about six months ago, are those still vulnerabilities in my service provider's infrastructure? How do you know if their best practices, if their systems, if the people managing those systems can be trusted? So one of the bottom lines in moving to the cloud, the best thing you can do is Ask for some certifications. If you can't physically you know, inspect the place yourself, ask for some proof of somebody who has. Ask for some documentation. Um, there's, it's amazing how few services out there can boast even an ISO 27001 certification, which is just a basic general um, certification that says nobody can access our systems but us. We have physical security. We have digital security. We have maintenance processes and programs that keep those securities, both physical and digital, current. It's, it's a, an evaluation of the business and its ability to keep you safe while you use their service and you're trusting them with it. Now the last part of the report is from the office of the CISO. And it's a little atypical of these kinds of reports. But we've just gone through something we felt was worth sharing. We have had to not just maintain the day-to-day uh, day -day operations. We've had to maintain them in the face of some massive integrations, and not just from two organizations, but three. And they're international. We're dealing with organizations around the world. And how do you deal with multi-country regulatory compliance issues privacy controls that have to be in place for the employees, for, you know, let alone our customers. There's so many issues about what information can be shared, who can access these things from this country versus that country that we've had to juggle around. A lot of systemic changes, equipment changes, um, solution changes, um, much of that consolidation. So we had to do that while we protected intellectual property. That's one of our core assets. And here you can see a quote that 84% of the total value of the S&P 500 is currently their intellectual property. It's not just the credit cards. Those things are great for the news. Oh, they, they love to talk about you know, people's records being compromised. Um, but that's really not where the big money is. Just like the spammers went from 85% down to 60 some odd percent, I mean, um, like a 40% drop in spam. But it was because they shifted where the money is. They are going to focus where the money is, and they're going to target specific organizations based on the value of the, of the data they have. We have seen insider threats where somebody was simply after the blueprints to a particular engine that was stolen. We have seen... Um, attacks that were targeted specifically to grab research information. This has been done and published actually in the news. There's been biomedical research. Uh, even oil exploration research was once um, a topic of an article not too many years ago where it was the goal. Only a handful of companies were attacked, very targeted, and the only parts of the company that were attacked were the research areas so that they could steal that research. Your intellectual property takes many shapes and form, and it has become one of the biggest targets. 
And when I gave the examples of the two attacks, Locky and Jaku, one of the things that also makes an aggregate threat like Jaku is Jaku is a massive network, highly flexible, constantly being updated, has many components for evasion, and while it's used in highly targeted attacks, they said, hey, we've got it running, let's also get consumers. So they build these very expensive res uh, resources, and then they try to figure out all the ways they can leverage it. It's just like a business. If you've built something, and you've built it for a particular market, and you're making some money, and all of a sudden you realize that, hey, you know what? If we add this capability and change this, we can sell it to a whole other market. It's business. And cyber attacks are big business. So they're going to target this intellectual property. That's where most of the money is going to be. And what we learned was before we started, we evaluated our security posture of all three organizations, learned some things. Each one has a different uh, CISO. The CISOs had prioritized things slightly different, and they had a great discussion. When you've got three CISOs in a room, and many of you uh, having been CISOs or attending those kinds of conferences, some of the best times you will have at those conferences is when you're just there with your peers talking about recent news or events. And that's what we were able to do is get these CISOs from three different organizations sharing their perspectives on why they made the choices they did and how are we going to consolidate just our, our general strategy and posture to continue to meet all of those differing objectives. Then, of course, based on that, they then assessed the network health and reported on all suspicious activity that violated not just current rules and regulations, that would violate the new security posture. Where are we going to have to make changes to make sure everything's at the current level of security? And then identify your most important data assets. Uh, one side note here is that if you've ever done a DLP program within your organization, that can be very painful unless you remember one key goal. Your job in IT is not to identify the data assets. That's somebody else's. Ask the people who do customer monitoring, who do support, who do manufacturing. Ask them to identify what data is most important to them. Have them help prioritize it. Then your job is to figure out the systems and processes, the tools and, and tr policies that have to be done to implement the proper levels of security as they've stated it. So have them build most of that high-level guidance so that you don't spend your time taking a guess and then running it past them to see if they think you guessed right. No, 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 that's not right. I want this other thing. This is, this is more important than that. Have them just set it up front. Now, we had to determine a lot of code vulnerabilities in, the, again, the variety of systems. And in the end, it was communication, communication, communication. We had so many people, and like I said, around the world, they had to constantly be communicating because things are very fluid in an IT organization. You're starting to set something up according to plan, you hit a, a problem, and you have a workaround. Well, everybody else needs to know you did the workaround because maybe they needed you to actually complete it a different way, and your workaround breaks something you weren't aware of. Communication's got to be high in order to make sure that one person doesn't break somebody else's thing. And I'm sure you all have your own favorite story of where somebody tried to do something and it shut something down. Um, you know, I still remember the, the fun stories of the, of the cleaning people who would come in and unplug a particular uh, system because they needed the outlet for the vacuum cleaner and didn't realize that while it was a small system, it wasn't in the room with all the servers and stuff. It was just out in the open. That was the gateway that had been set up as a workaround to help people in the field get real-time support and it ended up shutting down a major portion of the corporation. It cost them millions of dollars until they figured that out. They were trying to figure out why the system would go down every night about a particular time for about 20 minutes. And increase your monitoring. It's almost like you can't monitor enough. Um, this kind of ties to communication, communication, communication. You can't communicate if you don't know it's there. And this goes a little bit back to what we started on, talking about insider threat. You need to monitor everything going on. Some of that will give you insider activity. Some of it will tell you if there's some malicious activity. You need to know what is baseline, what's normal. You need to know and monitor are all the systems working. So there's obviously the performance level stuff. None of this is new, but these are uh, or this is a nice checklist of things that you might want to consider 
if, particularly if you're going into um, any kind of serious changes within your own organization. And of course, more details of this are available in the actual report itself. I want to summarize here basically some of the conclusions is we have, of course, seen a shift in the nature of attacks. And it's been a big one this last year. Uh, it's been not big because, hey, there's this new type of malware or there's this new technique that they're using to get around a common tool. It's the aggregate of all the little changes and the fact that they are now much more coordinated. And cybersecurity is a mainstream risk now. It's not just for um, you know, high-profile organizations. Um, we tend to have a, an attitude or want to find a way to explain it couldn't happen to us. We're not a target. We're a medium-sized organization. Uh, we work with other companies. Consumers don't know about us. There's hardly ever any news. You know, we just support you know, 18 different major organizations in our metropolitan area. Uh, we make good money at it. Um, we have huge systems that we support. But, uh, you know, we deal with making a lot of money on a small number of customers. So our volume's low. We just don't – we're not going to show up on anybody's radar. Well, you'd be surprised. Don't just think about the last year. Think of the last several years. We've had companies that were targeted because one of their customers became targeted. And the next thing you know – because of that relationship, they become a target. Uh, sometimes this was a target of groups like Anonymous, where a major organization had a particular social position that they took that offended people in different groups. And Anonymous took that to, uh, to task. And they decided not just to attack that company, but everybody who did business with them. And it was amazing how quickly they found out who all their vendors were. So you'll never know when you're going to be targeted, and you don't really know, most of us don't really have a clue if we are currently in a breach unless we have those online monitoring behavioral systems that we've been talking about. And keep in mind, those attacks can originate internally as well as externally. The reasons for internal motivations can be everything from somebody who was hired, obviously, up front to spy. That was the case of the... Uh, um, uh, the engine blueprints that somebody was trying to steal, the story I told earlier was uh, somebody, they were hired, and they knew they were going to do that up front. They were a spy. Uh, then we have people who they came in with all good intentions but quickly became disillusioned with the organization and its philosophies. Uh, that would be like an Edward Snowden. We have people who just, they're doing work and they're doing fine, but all of a sudden they get into gambling dates, debts, they pick up drug habits or otherwise need short-term cash, and they don't see it as being a big issue to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, credit card industries have had that as well, where processing, um, uh, processing divisions of the company found that a few people were skimming 1,000 credit card numbers and selling them online just to make a little extra money to cover uh, their debts or habits. Um, and they did it on a regular basis. Um, but they didn't steal a whole lot. They weren't looking to get rich. They just were trying to meet a particular financial incentive. A lot of this goes to opportunity, financial motivations, um, and whether or not we're, we're doing our job. A new approach is going to be needed to deal with the fact that internal and external, uh, everything from zero day to the way botnets are formed is also getting much more complex. We need to take a different approach on how this is going to be managed. And most of that involves communication, communication, communication. How do our solutions work together? How do our teams work together? If I'm finding an alert in one system, can I quickly correlate it with other systems? Are they sharing the information from an alert standpoint? Are they, is the threat intelligence underlying them being coordinated in any way, shape, or form? For example, the Jaku uh, information is we were taking that and, uh, and other research that we collect, we were sharing them with certs and other organizations, which also meant that it was being shared with some of our competitors. We've got to get some of this information out and make sure that everybody has the best chance of being protected. And this is kind of the philosophy we're trying to follow here. Now, at this time, I do have some questions I can see. So I'm going to um, move forward to 
taking some of these questions. Got to move my screen around a moment here. Um, there was a question here about a copy of the presentation, uh, a copy of the recording of the presentation, the report, and all of this. You'll be getting an email uh, within, uh, hopefully, within a week that will give you links to all of this information. And uh, somebody asked specifically about would a sandbox click the link and monitor results. Um, this goes to some evasion. Sandboxing evasion was something that came up. Uh, it's been a quick cycle. Uh, studying sandboxing is a great little microchasm, so to speak, that we can examine. It came out as the perfect solution. Everybody thought, how can a piece of malware possibly get around it? And then they very quickly realized that, hey, if I just sit there and do nothing for a while, I can get around it. Um, some of them would put a pop-up that says, do you wish to continue? And if there's no human interaction, that could be a problem. Well, there's ways to automate that. Uh, our own sandbox, for example, we can see a pop-up and see there's a button, and we can click it and see what happens. Um, email links, um, being able to check out you know, the link in active, uh, checking that out. We actually do that with uh, attachments, um, which includes more static attachments. But really to get around a lot of this um, in the sandboxing arena requires two kinds of analysis. You need behavioral sandboxing, which is what people tend to think about. That's a dynamic analysis. Watch it in process. But if the virus is actually written to wake up, check the date, check the time, and if it's not the right date, don't do anything. Now, this isn't new either. 30 years ago, there was a virus called Michelangelo. It woke up. It checked the date. If today was not Michelangelo's birthday, it did nothing. It shut down. So how would you find something like that? Well, you wouldn't find it in a behavioral analysis as easily as if you just do a static analysis. Static analysis is where I'm reading the code. It's more like an interpretive execution. Uh, and for those of you who've done programming with interpretive languages, there's compiled and then there's interpretive. And that's essentially a, a static analysis, or at least a good one would be interpretive, and most of them do that today. So we're reading the code. We find the loop that says, check the date if it's not shut down. Okay, I see that code. Let me go on to see what happened if it was the date. And you just read the code. So in a static analysis, I will see the behavior that would happen if the competition uh, or if the uh, – um, if the conditions were accurate. Um, and scrolling through this, uh, does Forcepoint offer sharing of large files in a secure fashion, similar to like Citrix file share? Um, actually, our email products, uh, you wouldn't be putting files, uh, large files in that, but they obviously include encryption and things like that for secure. Other than that, um, the file sharing services are not something we do, although our DLP, uh, both inline, endpoint, and even our Discover DLP products can actually check those services so that somebody can't use them to perhaps share stuff they're not supposed to. Uh, for example, um, we ourselves uh, use our Discover to regularly monitor the sharing services that we've selected and identify if somebody is perhaps posting something up there they shouldn't. This is an Office 365 thing. You've got your SharePoint services, which people can share files, and some of them you just don't even want up there, so we block those. But the other aspect is somebody did share it. They need to, but it was shared in a portion of SharePoint that those files don't go there. Too many people have access to it. And so having the ability to um, go back and do a sanity check is also important. Or just think of the one-offs. Um, if you're in a business where all of a sudden you're getting sued for something, your legal team may say, hey, we need to find all the documents that refer to this part. And so you set up a, a DLP discover activity to search where all those things are. And because of the current legal environment, you now have a new policy. You didn't have it at the time people were uploading stuff, so having just gateway isn't enough. Discover allows you to bring things back, get them back under control when conditions change. And <clears throat> welcome to the real world. Conditions change all the time. Um, another question here. Am I advising that sandboxing solutions should stop the threat um, or at least to get more protection besides the email model? Um, 
not sure if I'm going to get this right, but essentially sandboxing should be for both. If there's an email attachment, sandboxing is definitely um, a major benefit there. So you get both your static and dynamic analysis. Um, the problems that I was mainly trying to talk about is when it's a link or something we saw this year. Um, I didn't point it out. It's in the report. Macros. Um, Microsoft macro viruses. Not necessarily new. Mid-90s kind of technology. It's coming back. We saw 44% more use of macros last year. That's, that's a major spike. So, you know, almost 50% almost more than in the previous year. They're using it not because the virus is the macro, but quite often they're using it just like they use Java these days. The JavaScript is just to hide a link so that your regular email link analysis won't be able to catch it. So there's a, a number of things. And, of course, I have to avoid – there's – there's flaws in almost every one of these examples if you look at it right. That's the trouble with these kinds of things. You can just really chase these things down different rat holes. Um, so, um, you know, please forgive that I'm trying to highlight specific um, examples as I'm reading the questions here. Um, how to contact the sales department? Good question. We'll contact you. <laughs> um, yeah, somebody's asked for some specific questions. We'll take those offline. Um, oh, I thought that was a networking problem he was asking about. It actually was they couldn't connect to the video. They could only get audio. Interesting. Ah, how many locky infections do uh, to date? Um, currently, you know, I don't have a, a, a sum total. Um, actually, I know somebody actually gave that to me, but it was as of like several weeks ago. Um, right now, there's about 19,000. As of this morning, we saw a little over 19,000 currently infected victims, and uh, it was over 40,000 at its high point. Um, they are flipping rather quickly. And uh, the good news about Lockheed, let me tell you something here about ransomware in particular. Ransomware typically uses a botnet to get the key to encrypt. So the first thing they do is they send out. So if you've got something watching your web channel that's not just looking for DLP, it's not just looking for viral communications, but it's able to identify communications that are indicative of a botnet in use. I'm not just talking about URL. I'm talking about something that can see the packets and the formation of the communication that this looks like a call to a botnet. If they can shut that down, it never gets the key, and therefore it never gets encrypted. The data doesn't get encrypted until a key comes down. So there's a number of things you can do even once the system, quote, unquote, has been compromised. So an endpoint gets compromised with Locky, and then it starts encrypting. Other things would be, you know, the victims. We could, we could be getting an indication that a PC has been infected with Locky. It successfully called home to the botnet. But now that user's machine, they don't have access to anything important. It's, it's a, a receptions desk and and she's got, you know, or he's got all this access to, you know, general corporate statements and things like that. And so that stuff, you know, is starting to get compromised. But the intellectual property, the personal information in back-end systems, all of that may remain perfectly safe. So when we're monitoring it from our level, we don't have internal visibility to the organizations. We're only getting the indication of there is a machine, 19,000 this morning, 19,000 systems that are infected with Locky. Um, many of those could be yet the same organization, and they could all be unimportant. Um, what we have found is that the majority of them, though, tend to be more consumer level. Um, but they are starting to target, and that's, again, the big change between both Locky and Jaku. They're taking this system that they use perhaps you know, on a consumer crowd as a guinea pig, and they're using it in a very targeted way. So, and, and I really have struggled with, with a way to phrase that. Targeted attacks, nothing new. But the way they're doing it is new and unique because they're making every stage of the attack much more complicated. They're not just changing the lure to make it a business lure. They know that a business has typically, they have a gateway. A lot of them are using next-gen firewalls. You've got some advanced, you know, um, uh, network monitoring going on. You've got some endpoint solutions that you're keeping up to date. They can't count on old malware. So they need to put in systems that will, or in the threat, that will dynamically 
change. For example, if it installs on your system or infects, like it was a two-part downloader, the first part gets on there, tries to see what kind of antivirus you've got. It determines the virus is, or your antivirus is product X. Oh, well, then don't allow, download part two version A. Get me part two version R, because that was packaged in such a way that we tested it in advance to make sure that it was undetectable by this particular virus or antivirus product. So they'll get just the right components, and they do that. They do this testing. They, they can buy these products off the shelf. So they buy all the competitive AV products, um, and they, they will test it to make sure it'll get passed. Um, again, lots of requests for the PowerPoint, and you'll all get that email on it. Um, Let's see, they're looking for geo IP based filtering. Um, their geo information is used a variety of ways within the products. Um, and at this point, there's some information here. It looks like they may have actually tried something with a specific scenario that didn't work as straightforward as they wanted, but it should. Hmm. Based on what I'm reading in the question, I would say yes, but they allude that there was a problem. Um, essentially, geo information is used a lot on outbound communications. We use that primarily there. And so companies will simply say that nobody is allowed to connect to a website in, outside of these three countries because these are the three countries we do business with, and you should never have to go outside of that. Um, some of them will say the whole world except these three countries. So some of them are more inclusive or exclusive. Uh, so there's a variety of ways where geo-information can be used to restrict communications. Um, but it looks like somebody was asking about on the inbound side, can it be used to direct information? Um, and at this point, I don't believe it's used on the inbound traffic. Okay, I'm going back. We just had a couple more questions come in, and I think we're just about rounding out. Um, how often does Forcepoint update the solutions? Um, well, this is where it's kind of interesting. Our research labs is not just researchers. As a matter of fact, in order to be a researcher at Forcepoint, you have to be an engineer. You have to be a developer. And part of the test to be accepted is to make sure that you know how to code. Because at the core of the Triton solutions today uh, is this engine called ACE. It has over 10,000 different kinds of analytics across about eight different defense areas, everything from reputation analysis to you know, on-the-fly content analysis, decrypting encrypted JavaScript, PDF analyzers. There's all these different kinds of analytics in this engine. And that is actually written and maintained by the developers. Now, this is maintained also through our network. Um, it's called the Threat Seeker Intelligence Cloud. So we have this cloud network globally that at any time, our customers can connect to it and ask for a download. Most of them do it every five minutes. We sent updates last year to that system at the rate of 3.2 per second. So we are constantly feeding these updates to the cloud. Those are then downloaded to the customer. Most of those analytics come as part of that update. Now there are product updates. And so those updates are done about quarterly. Matter of fact, we have one coming out this week, I believe, in the next 24 to 48 hours, we'll have our next product release. Um, not big, big fanfare, a couple of really cool features in it, but we do that on a regular basis because the engines at even the lowest level have to be maintained frequently to stay current to deal with some of this. Uh, the good news is that a lot of the correlation of the information is done through that Threat Seeker Intelligence Cloud. That's how at 3.2 updates per second, we release information, and that same engine is used, for example, in web and email. We talked about that in the, uh, in the presentation today. So the same engine is in both products. So if we have an update because we found something on the website, the email product gets it exactly at the same time. So we have all of that. Um, all right. So at this point, it looks like most of the questions I'm seeing repeats and let's see. And some some technical specific questions we'll handle offline. 
All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for your time. Looks like several hundred of you have actually stayed on through this. So I hope the information was valid. If not, um, send us your questions offline. Uh, if something occurs to you as you read the report, feel free to reach out to us. Or with your, uh, if you're a customer, reach out to your sales rep. Um, the SEs actually go through special in-depth training on a lot of this information. Um, and if this is something that you'd like presented to your larger organization, um, you can also contact uh, your sales reps to try and arrange that um, since this presentation will be shared with the field and they'll be uh, trained on delivering as well as handling the Q&A from that. So a lot of good information here. Uh, you can download the report in the, um, in the resources link right now or like I said, you'll get an email shortly. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you.